Mm -hmm. And I see my daughter's on. That's nice. Yeah. What is her name again? Amy yeah. Siegel. Mrs. Siegel. Amy Siegel. Okay. Right. Mrs. Siegel. It's my granddaughter. Okay. And I think my brother, Chuck's coming on too. It's I'm there. Hi, there. Chuck's there. Hi. <laughs> Put this down. Okay. Okay. I'm okay. here. Good. Yeah. Yep. Oh, hi, Heather. Hi. Hi, Heather. Hi. I, I said, Rabbi Violet, Violet, we're here. Oh. She wouldn't be here. She'd be glued to CNN. Oh. No, so was I, but enough oh. is enough for today. Hi, <laughs> Rabbi. Right. Hello. I know. Uh, hi. 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 Let's see who else is. I can only see, I'll see six people. We have 22 participants, Terry. Okay, so let's see. I, I'm watching the way. Now this should tell, yeah, on this thing it doesn't tell. No, it does say 22. Okay, I get it, yeah. Okay, and I wonder. Oh, oh, now I have an invite. Let's see. Okay. All right. Hang on. Oh, there's John Spear. Hi, John. Now I'm going to turn this on silent. Oh, it's. No, it is 7.30, so I can welcome people now. Is, is everyone on? I can see, well, okay. I wanna welcome all of you to the 85th year of the Solomon B. Freehoff book and author series. This year, we are devoting the series to the memory of and honoring Violet Marcus. Violet was an exceptionally vibrant and wonderful member of the women of Rotosholem and of our congregation. She was a friend who touched many of our lives by her strength, kindness, and love. We are pleased that uh, her sons, Harold and Chuck, are with us, and her niece, Heather, and her granddaughter, Amy Siegel, and Maureen Marcus are with us today. Uh, Violet expertly chaired this committee uh, for 20 years. Because of the way Violet touched our lives, all of our reviewers this year we're happy to be part of this, our 85th year of the series. I wanna thank my co-chairs, Goldie Katz and Ellen Primus, and our wonderful Woman of Road of Shalom uh, program chair, Andy Kaufman, for their wonderful assistance in organizing these reviews on Zoom. Now I would like to call in the president of our, congr of our Road of Shalom congregation, Karen Breen. Great, thank you, Terry. Yeah. Excuse me, Karen, can I just cut in? I just want to let everybody know that we're recording and I'm going to mute everybody and people can unmute for questions later. If you're speaking, Karen, you're going to have to unmute yourself as soon as I mute everybody. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Andy. And um, if you could watch the waiting room now, I was watching it while you were doing the other. Um, so again, welcome uh, to this evening's 85th annual uh, Freehoff Lectures series, uh, book and author series. This is the first of seven reviews that we will have this year. Uh, we're very pleased that Rabbi Aaron Bisno is our speaker tonight, who will be reviewing Trevor Noah's book, Born a Crime. As Terry mentioned, um, we're, we're sad, um, uh, but also gratified to be able to dedicate this series to um, the memory of Violet Marcus. Um, I, I know that when we lost Violet, there was a, a tear in the thread, in the fabric um, of our community. And I know that when we are back, um, able to be together uh, at some point back at the high holidays, for example, worshiping together, we will all remember uh, Violet at the top of the steps, greeting everyone warmly and will be sorely missed in, in many ways um, by all of us. I look forward to Rabbi Bisno's uh, commenting on current events all of the time um, and his um, broad range of, of reading. So I'm, I'm eagerly looking forward to his view of Trevor Noah's very uh, personal 
reflection on what it was like to come of age in apartheid South Africa. And I know you'll be um, as eager as I am to hear the kinds of connections that Rabbi Bisno will make to that work, including, um, I'll give you a little teaser here of, um, being able to bring in some thoughts from Isabel Wilkerson's book, Cast. So um, with, with, uh, without taking any more time from Rabbi Bisno's presentation, I'd like to present our Rabbi Aaron Bisno to give tonight's talk. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, Terry, Andrea, all of you for sharing part of your evening uh, with me and allowing me to be with you. I'm really very grateful. And I always thrill to be part of this series that Violet spearheaded uh, for so long, um, and it's a privilege now to, to open this year series in, in her memory. So um, we remember Violet, and um, I dedicate this, this uh, exploration of ideas. Thank you, Karen, for framing it that way to, to her memory um, and all of the righteousness and good acts that, that she championed. Um, you may know that she had a, a long stint, an impressive um, and impactful stint at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission um, and champion the rights of all kinds of people. And you're gonna see much of that in, um, in what I'm gonna share with you this evening. So I'm, gonna, I'm new at sharing my screen, but that's what I intend to do. Oh wait, I don't think I have that ability yet. Andrew, I need to get that ability, please. So I can share, there we go. All right, so let's see that. All right, so we're gonna talk about, I'm gonna see how well I can do this. Trevor Noah's book, Born a Crime. Trevor Noah is perhaps known to you as a comedian, a South African born comedian, a host now of The Daily Show. He was the successor to Jon Stewart. Um, and in this book, he tells his own story of growing up in Johannesburg under apartheid and in the years following. His story, however, is uh, an incredibly personal one because he describes what it was to grow up colored or of mixed race um, through a union through his Swiss-born um, father. There he is, let me pull that up, a little bit more of that, who was a restaurateur in Johannesburg and the relationship that was illicit and illegal that his father shared with uh, Trevor's mother. As a result, he was a product of this union and lighter than his mother, had to spend much of his earliest childhood indoors, uh, not allowed to play with his other cousins and, and nephews and, um, and, and, and his family. Here's a picture of Trevor with his mom, to, he to whom he really credits his ability to get out of um, apartheid South Africa to dream of freedom. He was a social misfit uh, when he grew up. This child born mm -hmm. of a Zosa mother, X-H-O-S-A, a tribe mm -hmm. in South Africa, and his Swiss father, both of whom could have been imprisoned for the crime of their interracial sexual relations. Uh, and Trevor also could have been taken away uh, readily by the state. He was a social misfit who made his way out of poverty and no little danger through entrepreneurial ingenuity, comic genius, and ability to speak a number of tribal languages. He himself speaks six languages, which allowed him to move between populations and move between um, uh, the different people. This is another picture of his mother once he moved her to New York. Um, Trevor Noah is today um, a social commentator that uh, is, who is recognized for his ability to hold a mirror up to American society as a result of his own, his own experience uh, as a child. I'll use some, just a few more of I'll give you a sense of who he is. Um, he moves back and forth in this book between jokes and earnest insights. And in this most compelling memoir, Born a Crime, which is fun to read, I'm told it's even better, at least that's what the PR agents have online, if you get the audio book and you hear Trevor read it to you in his own voice with his accents and with, with uh, lots of animation. Um, his book provides a harrowing look through the prism of his own family at life in South Africa under apartheid and the country's lurching entry into a post-apartheid era in the 1990s. Some stories will be familiar to those who have heard him speak of uh, his, his family tales on television, and others are less polished anecdotes of a comedian underscoring the absurdity of life under apartheid, where he is one thing in one household and considered altogether another um, in another household. He's largely raised by his grandmother, 
um, in the uh, black section of Johannesburg. And then his mother is able to secret him out from time to time from the kinds of neighborhoods. Uh, well, that's too small to see, sorry for that. Um, but the kinds of, of squalor in which the blacks of South Africa live juxtaposed with the home that his mother insisted on renting, albeit illegally in Johannesburg, which is what gave her an opportunity to meet the man who would be uh, Trevor's, Trevor's father. Whoop, that's not what I'm saying. They grow, he grows up between these two worlds um, and his mother, this Zosa mother and Swiss German father, he recalls that the only time I could be with my father was indoors. If he left, if we left the house, he would have to walk across the street from me. It was dangerous as a light skinned child to be seen with my mother as well. She would hold my hand or carry me. But if the police showed up, she would put me back on the sidewalk and pretend to be my maid. Um, his cousins weren't completely comfortable with him because his light skin would give him away. And so he spent a lot of time alone, but describes that he wasn't a lonely child. He was very good at being alone. He read books and played with uh, the single toy that he had. He made up imaginary worlds. He lived inside his head. He says that to this day, you can leave me alone for hours. And I'm perfectly happy entertaining myself. In it's fact, I have to remember to be with people. Aaron, it seems like you're not sharing the screen. All we're getting is the front cover of the book. Oh my God, you've seen none of these other pictures? Nope. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. So this is what I'm learning how to share the screen. All right. That's okay. I apologize. I, I was working on trying to figure out how to do it on YouTube. So that's why I missed all that. Oh my gosh. Okay, so let me, let me quickly go back. Which screen do you see now? Do you see that screen? Now we see everybody. We see the either speaker view or whoever. All right, well, there's, all right, I'm so sorry. I thought you were seeing the pictures that I was putting up. I apologize. But this is, can you see that, Trevor's father? Yes. Yes. Okay, yes. good. Can you see um, Trevor's mother? No. No. We still see him and his father. Oh, okay. So, uh, so I apologize. So how about now? You. Okay. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's his mother. Yeah. Yep. Oh, it's lovely. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep, we have it? his mother. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, there it is, right? All right. Okay, so let me then share the next one. I'm gonna back, slow down and go back up. Oh yeah, I keep losing the screen. I wish I knew I'd do this better. I apologize. Um, do you see that picture? You again. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that I don't want to do this better. Um, hmm. How can I do this then? Well, maybe I'll tell you this story and then I'll, I, I don't know, I wanted to show you these pictures. Olivia taught me how to do this earlier and I didn't pay close enough attention. All right, we're gonna do it this way. One second, one second, I apologize. Let me, let me... Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you see Trevor? Yes, we do. There's yeah, Trevor, yep. Okay, there's Trevor, and I showed you earlier um, his mother. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. And the, do you see the picture of Pretoria? No, no we no. didn't see Pretoria. <laughs> okay. Oh, I'm so sorry. So, so, so. He grows up in, in there. Do you see that? There it is. Mm -hmm. Okay, I wish I knew this better. I'm so sorry. He grows up in. in, in, in um, there's that, and then. I have to do this every time like this. You're not seeing that. Okay, let me just read it to you then. I apologize. Thought that would be better. Okay, sorry. I really have some nice pictures. Um, all right, I'm, I'm, give me a moment. We indulge okay. me for a moment while I figure this out. Of course, take the moment. Do you see that on my screen? Yes. That, that oh. series of files? I see a series of files, yes. Okay, do you see that? Do you see that picture? Nope. No picture, oh. just a file. Just a file. Oh, new share. All right, all right, let me do this. Hang on, I got it. I'm going to do it this way. Sorry, give me a moment. I don't know what set up, you guys. We've got to share my
Maybe your kids can help you. Yeah, maybe they can. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me read this to you. I apologize. Um, he spent much of his time at home when he was growing up. He language he discovered was a way to camouflage the difference that he would be toggling between. His mother knew to speak Zosa, Zulu, German, Afrikaans, and Soto, and used her knowledge to cross boundaries, handle situations, and navigate the world. She made sure that English was the first language her son spoke. Because if you're black in South Africa, speaking English is the only thing that can give you a leg up. English is the language of money, he was taught. English comprehension is equated with intelligence, he was taught. If you're looking for a job, English is the difference between getting the job and staying unemployed. Trevor became a gifted mimic. He learned to become a chameleon, using language to gain acceptance in school and on the streets. If you spoke to me in Zulu, I replied to you in Zulu. If you spoke to me in Swana, I replied to you in Swana. Maybe I didn't look like you, but if I spoke like you, you accepted me as you. He was able in this way to move between worlds. He was born in 1984, literally the product of a crime when apartheid's anti-miscegenation laws made the interracial, interracial relationship between his parents criminal. Integration by its nature was a political act, writes Noah, as he weaves through his mother's constant attempts to thwart the apartheid law while working as a secretary and socializing in underground racially mixed circles. She used her connections in these underground circles to secretly run a place downtown, as I mentioned, downtown Johannesburg where black people were forbidden to reside unless they were laborers. She learned from the neighborhood prostitutes how to disguise herself as a maid so that she could navigate outside after curfew without the special IDs that blacks were required to carry. If caught without identification after curfew, one could be fined or jailed. Sometimes Mrs. Noah caught and paid the fine, but she defiantly remained a resident in the area. Throughout the book, Noah reveals many examples of his mother's stubborn determination to prevent apartheid from suffocating her free spirit. Humor became his mechanism. Humor became his mechanism for moving between these realities. If my mother had one goal, and she's the hero of his book, if, she, if he, she had one goal, it was to free my mind. Even before they knew apartheid would end, she wanted him to live freely. And she took him to places that black South Africans considered white things, like ice rinks mm -hmm. and the suburbs. I'm reminded how the story of Princess Diana taking her boys, William and Harry, to amusement parks or to places that otherwise they would never have experienced as royals. We're gonna come back to that idea. Because even if he never leaves the ghetto, his mother would explain to her family, he will know that the ghetto is not the world. If that is all I accomplish, I have done enough. It was her aim, he writes, to keep him from internalizing his oppression and to convince him that he was greater than the social labels. No, his mother also gave him permission to dream beyond his circumstance. Because her son was of mixed race, he often wasn't allowed to go outside. And so he took his flights through his imagination. Now, the connection between what Trevor Noah describes and what we are, have in our own American history, and certainly what we have seen now revealed in the last six, eight months over this past summer where race and Black Lives Matter and all kinds of rhetoric and reality that confront those of us, I don't know if they're in this room, uh, perhaps uh, uh, who, who are of color or who fall into categories that are easily defined by outsiders, the connection between Noah's story in South Africa and what continues to happen every day is not lost on me. This is from an interview that Noah gave to the New York Times Magazine a few weeks ago. He says, look, one of the liberating things about apartheid is that we were not under the illusion that we were free or that things were fair. When you look at apartheid laws and how they were created, they were adopted from so many different places around the world, a little bit from the Netherlands, a little bit from Australia, a little bit from America. They put all these things together and added their own South African spices to make a perfect blend of racism. 
I want to share with you um, the connection I want to draw here right between one second. Oh. Okay. Between what Trevor Noah describes. And how do I get there to what Wilkinson, Wilkerson describes in her book? Do I have it here? I don't know how to get it. Um, Isabel Wilkerson. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. Oh, you do? Yes. Yes? It's not very good to write that, pic oh, that picture. But there it is. Isabel Wilkerson, who is a... Um, a national medalist uh, and, and, and a Pulitzer Prize winning author writes in this book, which has got an enormous amount of credit about what she refers to looking through a lens of at America as caste. Now we tend to think of caste. Yeah, Indian caste system. Yeah, that's not so good, but, but it's too small, but you'll forgive me. Uh, but from the Indian caste, where caste is the infrastructure of our divisions, mm -hmm. she writes. Caste mm -hmm. is like the bones of an old house, the studs and joists that we cannot see in the physical buildings we call home. Caste is the unseen stirrings of the human heart. Caste is on stage a performance, and caste is also somehow the wordless usher in a darkened theater. Caste is structure. Now, what Wilkerson does is toggle between racism or race and caste. And she essentially says that caste is the system wherein it is understood that there's a hierarchy of people. And that hierarchy is based on some characteristic or quality. Often race is used as that defining characteristic. And in this way, racism, if you will, is the handmaiden of caste. Caste is the formation of society in such a way that people are put into divisions or some are higher than are others. Some have certain privileges. Others are born into circumstance that is defined by immutable characteristics. Racism, or if you will, sexism or anti-Semitism is the way in which that is lived out or that is the way in which caste is performed or enacted. For this book, this Pulitzer Prize winning author writes, I wanted to understand the origins and evolution of classifying and elevating one group of people over another. For that purpose, racism was insufficient. Sure. Um, to that one, this is from South Africa. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's the way I can do. Can you see all these? What do you see now? Do you know the park bench? Yeah. Yes. That happens, to be from, that happens to be from South Africa. Right. Right? This one, it's a little small, but is a, is a bus in the South yeah. in the 60s. Yep, we're getting the pictures now. You getting it? Well, I'm doing sort of back. Right. I'm glad. Um, ugh, it's just not big. I thought it was going to be bigger. Um, forgive me. That that's uh, a sign that's in uh, Johannesburg, or maybe it was Soweto. This is. Now you see it. Now you see it, right? Right. Right. There we go. We'll do it that way. Yes, we see them. Right, these are from the American South. Look at this one. This one, if you can see it, it's a little small. Um, Lady right. separated Western from. Right. Even I was amazed to see this. You recognize that font and that kind of thing. This is on federal or or, or national park land. Um, that was obviously maintained by a local population. Um, and this one is really disturbing. This bespeaks the idea of, of caste as much of about racism when it's put up in this, in this kind of way. The most accurate to this term to describe the workings of American society, Wilkerson writes, I wanna. And always that 
sense that the perpetrator feels that they're the victims. In the end, the, when, it's, when, it, when the oppression is overturned. Yeah, right? right, right, right. Wilkerson describes race as strictly a visible phenomenon, a hologram, a decoy, or a front man with respect to caste. By contrast, caste is firm, fixed, and rigid, so rigid, it has shape shifted to keep the upper caste pure by its own terms. And we know something, at least anecdotally, I'm sure most of us do, that the, the Nazis in Germany appropriated some of what we were already doing here uh, in, the, in the States. And apartheid borrowed also, and we appropriated different parts of this too. The idea of a pure race or the idea of people being better than or people not being able to marry up or into other groups is the structure of caste. And it matters not at all whether it's about people born into a certain strata or people born of a certain race or religion or what have you, or how much of that blood you have in you. Um, in the United States, 19th and early 20th century European immigrants, such as the Irish, entered the nation and were called Negroes turned inside out, and Black people in turn were called smoked Irish. Not a century later, however, whiteness had evolved and enveloped the Irish, folding their descendants and contemporary equivalents into the body politic. The ethnic, religious, and cultural makeup of the upper caste has changed since Plymouth Rock. Jews are now in the upper class, but the necessity of a bottom caste has not. That remains. Despite race's mutability, the American bottom caste, Wilkerson argues, is and has always been the black, or her preferred designation, the African American. Now, what's powerful about that is to appreciate that in only a few generations, the role of where Jews are in the social strata has so dramatically shifted that today it's not even a story that Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump and Joe Biden, the last presidential candidates, whatever side you're on, they all have children raising Jewish grandchildren if, not, if their children themselves have not converted to Judaism. That powerful people in the government are Jewish. You can like them or not like them. Mnuchin, Miller, Jared Kushner, and the fact that they're Jewish isn't the story. The Supreme Court, whether you like who's on it or not, is only populated, amazingly, Catholics and Jews, two immigrant groups that once were lower caste and now are essentially among the Brahmin of society. Not only that, Jews have been, with the exception of Jerome Powell, who runs the, uh, the Fed now, who's not Jewish, the last people in that job and in the Treasury Department have been Jews. Right, whether it's Yellen or Bernanke or Greenspan or Rubin or Summers or uh, Mnuchin, right? The Jews are running the economy and it's not a story. The worst villains in our society, the Jeffrey Epsteins and the, and the Harvey Weinsteins, paradigms of egregious, outrageous, atrocious behavior. The fact they're Jewish isn't, I mean, you and I know it, but we're not, it's not the same Shonda as it used to be. And the biggest marker of having accepted or moved into the upper caste is with regard to marriage. And while the Jewish community, certainly in the 70s, the 80s, even into the 90s, was decrying the high rates of intermarriage, which we understood as a community to be a concern because we saw that as Jews leaving the community or marrying out was the language. In point of fact, it, be, it, it revealed that it was the first time in Jewish history that people have wanted to marry into the Jewish community and to do so in such high numbers because it's not a step down or socioeconomically, it's not a step backwards, perhaps quite the contrary. And yet to this day, marrying someone brown or black is still an issue. Guess who's coming to dinner, right? We're still, we're still very much there. Cast Wilkerson writes is a social order that subsumes race. Mrs. Wilkerson writes of an incident said by the historian Sunil Kilnani, which is almost certainly apocryphal, that when Martin Luther King visited India in 1959, at a school, he was introduced by pariah children, the principal, inter, inter, a school of pariah children. 
He was introduced, Dr. King was, by the principal as a fellow untouchable from the United States of America. In that moment, Wilkerson tells us, King realized that the land of the free had imposed a caste system not unlike the caste system of India or Trevor Noah's experience in South Africa. In the American caste system, Wilkerson writes, the signal of rank is what we call race, the division of humans on the basis of their appearance. Race, she continues, is the primary tool and the visible decoy, the front man for caste. And what exactly is caste? She's always trying to explain it. it, is a fixed and embedded ranking of human value that sets the presumed supremacy of one group against the presumed inferiority of another group on the basis of ancestry. The full pageantry of American cruelty is on display in casts as surely as it is the backdrop to Trevor Noah's autobiography. Hers is an expansive interrogation of racism and institutionalized inequality and injustice, a deeply ingrained caste system that has been in place longer than our nation itself, existing back to colonial Virginia. Wilkerson's choice of examining caste rather than race is a valuable one for us, for this book is not one of biology, but rather structural power, not biology or social history, but structural power. And in the last number of months, the last half year, we've certainly been familiarized with new terminology, not only terminology such as, such as this, but also notions of our own privilege and our own responsibility, our complicity even for a system that we may not even have recognized existed and has rewarded us in many cases, but that nonetheless we now, I hope, recognize must be addressed and dismantled. Cass Wilkerson writes as a concept can be dizzying, but she makes plain the deeply embedded infrastructure of American hierarchy Caste is why Robert E. Lee, the Confederate general who went to war against his own country for the right to enslave other human beings, caste is why he can be honored by 230 memorials across this land. It is why Alabama was the last state in the union to throw out its law banning interracial marriage in 2000, 20 years ago. 36 years after the Civil Rights Act ended segregation, it is why Lyndon Johnson, who signed that act into law, was the last Democrat ever to win the presidency with the majority of the white electorate. That's amazing. That's amazing. Lyndon Johnson was the last Democrat ever to win the presidency with the majority of the white electorate. This is an American reckoning, and it should be. Wilkerson's book is... A, let me get back up. Trevor Noah's book is wonderful. It's delightful. It's engaging. It's it's captivating. It's 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 a it's a it's an engaging read as you'd expect a social commentator who's a comedian uh, with with such a vast experience uh, to present. Cast by Wilkerson is about how brutal misperceptions about race have disfigured the American experiment. That's the words of Dwight Garner. He was reviewing this book in the New York Times uh, this past summer. A caste system, after all, is an artificial construction and a fixed and embedded ranking of human value that sets the presumed supremacy of one group against, as I said, the presumed inferiority of another basis on ancestry and mutable traits that would be neutral in the abstract, but are ascribed life and death meaning. She reflects on the 2016 election. And I think in the wake of what's uh, coming to us by way of the, the results of our current election, where we recognize how divided our nation is with regard to rejecting either that which Donald Trump is presenting or being at least okay with it. It's about 50-50 split. And it basically comes down to which side of which state line you're on as to whether your vote gets counted. If you're a Republican in California, your vote doesn't matter, it turns out. And if you're a Democrat in, uh, I don't know where, Utah, Wyoming, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. 
She says this about the 2016 election and American politics in general. She asks, why do so many intellectuals and pundits on the left pose with increasing befuddlement the following question? Why do the white working classes in America vote against their economic interests? She runs further with the notion of white resentment than many commentators have been willing to. And her argument follows the course of that thinking. She writes, what these pundits have not considered is that the people voting this way are in fact voting their interests, maintaining their caste system as it has always been is in their interest. And some are willing to accept short-term discomfort, to forego health insurance, to risk contamination of their air and water, and even to die by a virus to protect their long-term interest in the hierarchy as they have known it. That's chilling, that's chilling. But all of us are self-interested to varying degrees and we misunderstand perhaps, Wilkerson is suggesting, those who seemingly vote against their interests but are very much interested in returning this country to a time when their group enjoyed hegemony that was all but unquestioned. As a, I'm gonna revert back to, to, to Noah then, then tie this up. As a child, Trevor Noah, was always the outsider, the interpreter, and the middleman. He writes, my entire family life, I grew up with a black family and a white family, and I had to translate what was happening between them. I, knew up, I grew up initially going to a white school that had just been integrated, and I constantly moved between groups. My early life taught me that there are few absolutes in the world that most everything is shaded and nuanced, reflecting and refracting our own respective limited experiences. I've come to accept, he continues, that I was forged by having to be an intermediary. I've gotten more and more comfortable going like, hey, white people, if you ever wanna talk about race and racism, I'm your dude, let's go. In the end, born a crime is not just an unnerving account of growing up in South Africa on a, under apartheid, and not only a love letter to the author's remarkable mother who grew up in a hut with 14 cousins and determined that her son would not grow up paying what she called the black tax, where black families have to spend all of their time trying to fix the problems of the past, using their skills and whatever education they had to bring their relatives back up to zero because the generations who came before you were pillaged just read as I was looking for some of the images I wanted to share with you of Trevor Noah about his contract being renewed and for $28 million, he's come a long way from his uh, grandmother's and his mother's uh, huts in, in, uh, in, in black South Africa. But it's clear without being um, pedantic or trite that we have much further yet, yet to go to realize our own uh, sense of the promised land or the American promise. Uh, to all. And I commend to you both Trevor Noah's book, Born a Crime, it's a fun read, uh, and Isabel Wilkerson's book, Cast, which is really a significant, important uh, contribution to our understanding. What, what, what it is that is behind the scenes or what it is that animates so much of our understanding of who we are uh, as, a, as a country. So with that, I, I thank you for the opportunity and uh, for indulging me in my my lack of thereof of digital screen sharing skills. But I'm happy to entertain any questions. I look forward to uh, a healthy conversation. Aaron, do you know how to um, end the sharing of the screen? Okay. There you go, you did it. Okay, there. Right. If anybody would like to unmute to ask questions, please go ahead and unmute. I cannot unmute people, I can only mute you. Or you could ask the question in the chat and I will ask it to Aaron. Just comment rather than a question. Um, first of all, you know, all of the growing up and the, all the impish things you did were you know, quite wonderful, including uh, the time he set fire to garage or had it decided that they were going to use explosives. Uh, he was, you know, he was quite a pistol and, yeah. and his description uh, of his relationship with dogs. Yeah. And and how he viewed it versus you know the rest of the community you know view dogs 
Um, and the time he went to a fancy restaurant and they had bones. Right. Right. <laughs> and he yeah. says, he says to the restaurant, you know, this is what dogs eat too. You know, right. this is what poor people do. And you're, right. you, you know, you, you're doing this in a five-star restaurant. It's quite funny. Good. Yeah, no, he has lots of fun anecdotes. And he, uh, yeah. His voice comes through loud and clear. But, yeah. But uh, the, the standards that she kept were just extraordinary. And the, their relationship. Um, his mother and he, yeah. Right. Yeah. And even that period when um, they they exchanged business letters there. Mm-hmm. Do you remember that? Yeah. Uh, and, and how he would write in the business so that he would expand his vocabulary. She was remarkable in, in the way in which she um, in, in encouraged him and indulged him and used humor. You know, I gave a talk on, um, on Shavuot that evening about the role of humor um, in Viktor Frankl's work and in um, um, uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, Reinhold Niebuhr's work, um, about the role of humor and, and how humor and faith are very closely related. And I had some quotes as I was going through some of the research with Trevor Noah. He also talks about humor's, uh, uh, what humor affords us or allows us by way of tolerating something that's all but intolerable or making sense of or reconciling or just holding up simultaneously paradoxical realities. That if I'm in this house, I'm allowed to do this, I'm in this house, I'm allowed to do that by law, and that's ridiculous, right? Or my parents are, are not allowed to be together, and yet, right? I mean, that kind of reality just doesn't make sense. The role of humor, and dissidents have written about that uh, as well, and that becomes a powerful force for animating uh, Noah's ability to escape his experience. Karen? But you're muted. Karen, you're muted if you're trying to ask a question. Everyone's muted, so. No, I was just going to say, I think this it, this issue of, of English as a way to get economic advancement. Um, I recently listened to the, the podcast, How I Built This, which was with um, Louis Van An, the founder of Duolingo. And he grew up in Guatemala and saw around him that those who were learning English were able to advance. And I just think that whole issue of um, English knowledge, language knowledge, and economic advancement is something really important. Powerful. Yeah. And, and, and the ability, we should add, after all, Duolingo, to know more than one language. Right. Just the, the, the appreciation or understanding it gives you of just a different culture or the way it expands your understanding of, I mean, how, how useful foreign words are to us at just the right moment, right? Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot yeah. of uh, the significance yeah. of that. Yeah. Intelligence, yeah. creativity, right? Being more open to different kinds of ideas when you know more, more than one language. You tend to be more open-minded. Right. Interesting, mm-hmm. you know? But I didn't realize how stratified South Africa was because we were there with the World Union yes. right after apartheid. And I didn't realize that if you were light brown, you had to live in a certain area. If you were darker, you had to live in a certain area. Yeah. Which is yeah. really horrible, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Are there any other questions? Okay. Oh, well, thank you, Rabbi Disno. This was a wonderful report, and uh, well, thank you. It's interesting yeah, to find more out about more about the caste system and what's going on, and hopefully things will change eventually. But uh, yeah. and uh, I'd like, and anyways, next week on November twelfth at seven thirty, Helen Faye Rosenblum, the writer, teacher, and book reviewer, is going to be reviewing Monogamy by Sue Miller, and uh, please join us then. And thank you so much, Rabbi Bisno. Thank you. And, and thank you, Violet's family, because Violet 